Okay, we are starting a study on Jeremiah tonight. Um, we aren't actually going to look at any of the book of Jeremiah. Um, we we're just going to talk about the book for, for tonight. We'll start on chapter 1 next week. So if you don't know, uh, Jeremiah is a, is a book of the Old Testament um, called, a, um, called one of the books of the prophets. There's Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, Habakkuk, all of them. And uh, Jeremiah is one of them. So as far as who Jeremiah was as a person, um, he's, if, I'm, if memory serves correct, he's the only prophet in the Bible who's specifically called a prophet to the nations. So that kind of sets him apart as, from others. Um, as far as where he's mentioned, um, not all the prophets are mentioned throughout the Bible, but Jeremiah is. He's mentioned in Second Chronicles, Ezra, and Daniel. Well, to be specific, his prophecy is mentioned in Daniel. He actually isn't mentioned. So it's his prophecy that's mentioned. Um, it, he came from a place called Anathoth. Um, that's hard to say a couple of times. Anathoth. Feels like your tongue is sticking on something. Um, it's uh, it's a little city that, or more like a town um, that's near Jerusalem. And uh, if you know anything about the area, if you don't, I'll show a map in just a minute, so don't, don't worry too much about it. Um, he was born from a family of priests. We don't know a whole lot about it, though, because it only gives the name of his father. So we can't, as some other prophets, we can't really trace the genealogy too far. But it might have been connected with the um, priests that King Solomon deposed. See, there was this... Um, the, King Solomon was one of the king, the second king of the, of the, well, I guess you could say the third king of, of Israel. And uh, there were some people when he first started his reign that he had to kind of get rid of because they kind of caused a problem. And one of them was this priest, and he, you know, sent him off to Anathoth. And that's that's recorded in, um, I want to say it's first kings. And uh, when he, you know, when he sent him off, um, it's possible that, that, that Jeremiah comes from that same family. We don't know that for sure, but there might have been, you know, multiple priestly families living in Anathoth. Um, so as far as how else we can connect him, there was a king named King Josiah at the time of Jeremiah the prophet, and they were renovating the temple, and they found the Book of the Law, and the person who found the Book of the Law was a person named Hilkiah. Now, this is right around the same time as Jeremiah prophesied, and his father is mentioned as Hilkiah, so it is possible, once again, being a family of priests, it is possible that it's the same Hilkiah, but um, don't, uh, don't you know, stake anything on that. Uh, Jeremiah is in a very interesting prophet because he wasn't too into his job, I guess you could say. Um, in, in public, he was always firm. You know, he, he, he said the word of God, you know, what God told him to say and everything. He did what he was supposed to do. But in, in private, he was very reluctant. He very much had a problem with, with, with what he was doing. He was very, um, I guess you say, um, depressed about it, burnt out. He had, to tell, he had to talk to people about God, and they didn't want to listen. And God actually told them, hey, they're not going to listen. And so he tried praying for them, and he said, "Don't bother praying for them because I'm not gonna not gonna hear your prayers about it." And so, so it was kind of like a, a losing situation. <laughs> and uh, so he stuck with this for somewhere over forty years, and you can just really see his his inner struggle and 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 depression and burnout through it um, in the book. And we'll look at that as we go through the book. And I just think that's very interesting because you know we have this idea of what a prophet looks like in our head, and and you know they go to like the Walmart parking lot and they're like, "You're going to hell, and you're going to hell," and that's not what Jeremiah was like at all. And um, I, I, he has a lot of depth to him, and I, I really like the way that um, the Bible shows us that struggle. Because sometimes we have this idea, like prophets, I mean, not prophets, uh, pastors, you know, they always enjoy what they're doing, and they never have struggles. And, you know, Christians never have struggles. And, you know, if you do do the work of God, you'll never have struggles. But Jeremiah shows us, you know, the truth of, 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 of a struggle, you know, that you can do something, even do something noble or good, and still just have a hard time reconciling it. Um, but uh, something that's interesting to me is that suicide was never an option for Jeremiah. It wasn't like, oh, you know, my life is a waste. Nobody's going to listen. I might as well just kill myself. That, that was never an option. Um, another thing that I wanted to mention is is if you read through the Old Testament, we're, we're reading through the Bible this year, if you care to join us. Um, and uh, every prophet in the Old Testament has a different personality that comes through. And uh, we've looked at Obadiah, and uh, there was another prophet that we looked at, and I can't think of who it was right now. Um, it's, it's gone. It, it's on my YouTube, but I'm not going to remember it. Um, and in each of the, the different prophets, we see a different personality come out. And, uh, and uh, it's something to watch out for if you read through the Bible. Um, let's see. So one of the key themes in Jeremiah is that 
as Jeremiah prophesied, uh, he didn't seem to be making a difference. And um, it's hard to do something continually day after day when you uh, don't see much of a difference and it feels like all your efforts are wasted. So that, that gives us a very interesting lesson to learn from this, and that's just because a thing is from God doesn't mean it'll always work out. So about the book itself, uh, Jeremiah is, is influenced strongly by three other prophets who prophesied before him. If you read their books and you read his books, you're going to see that he um, references and, and even, I guess you could say in modern terminology, cites a lot of their works. Hosea, Amos, and Isaiah are the three. Um, he also uh, does the same thing a lot with the book of Deuteronomy, which if you're um, unfamiliar with the Old Testament, that's one of the books of the law that Moses wrote. So like the first books are Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. The Deuteronomy is the one that he, um, that he uh, mentions quite a lot. Um, and this is this might have something to do with the fact that the book of the law was found um, by King Josiah um, just before he started prophesying. Um, the book itself is not in chronological order. If you're trying to figure out how the pieces fit in by just reading it, you're, you're, it's just not going to happen. But it's not really put in topological order either. <laughs> it just it's it's something that people argue quite a bit about trying to figure out, you know, when the different things happened and why it was organized in this way. And so I'll, I'll, uh, I'll present to you as we go through the book the, 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 the popular dating for the different prophecies. But after it was written, it's very, very likely was edited by someone afterwards um, because some of the things are talked about in third person, like, hey, Jeremiah did this and Baruch, his scribe, went and did this. It's like, well, why would they want write about themselves in third person? Like, I don't do that. <laughs> Michael's teaching Yams right now. and then <laughs> like, yeah. So we can assume that there was an editor sometime after that. Um, <clears throat> I typo there, but uh, he, Jeremiah had a had a scribe that helped him. Uh, his name was Baruch. Uh, you will will mention him as he come up, comes up, and he actually had a um, specific prophecy that was written towards him that we will uh, look at. You can uh, separate the book, in a, and I, I've listed two different ways. The second way is my way. It's a very dumbed down, basic version. But this first way um, is from a book by. Mm. It's not going to come back. I, I, if you're interested, I'll look it up. But I, it's not. It's it's not there right now. Uh, it's it, how he separates the books is he separates it into, into three books. There's book one, which is chapters one through twenty-five. There's book two, which is called the Book of Consolation, which is only chapters thirty through thirty-one. And then there's book three, which is against the nations, which is forty-six through fifty-one. And um, then it has two little. Um, his, more historical things. There's a bi there's biographical interludes at chapters 26 to 29 and 32 through 30, 45, and then there's a historical appendix at the very end that just kind of closes it off and shows about how the Babylonian Empire came in and destroyed the city, and that's just kind of how it ends. Um, so uh, another way that uh, way that I separate it just to kind of make it a little bit easier, I think, to to kind of you know up here to kind of get what's going on is you could say. Um, the first part is more concerning God's people, which is chapters 1 through 18, 17. And then Jeremiah's struggles with either in, a, in his own heart or with the people who are opposing him. There are a lot of false prophets that were attacking him, a lot of um, leaders that were attacking him. And obviously, you know, once again, he had this inner struggle. So uh, that's recorded from Genesis, from, I'm sorry, chapters 18, 18 through chapter 45. And um, then the last section would be concerning the nations where he talks about the different uh, prophets. Um, so if if you take my my way of separating the book, the simple way here, the historical appendix mentioned there um, actually becomes the reason for some of the judgment on the nations rather than um, recording the fulfillment of the prophecy. So um, let me let me say it like this. If my way of separating the book is correct, that would mean that the historical appendix, what its purpose is serving is saying, okay, so judgment is coming on the nations in part because of what they did to Jerusalem. But if I'm wrong in my in my breakup, then it would just be a, hey, Jeremiah said that the city would be destroyed and here's the fulfillment it was destroyed. So, I mean, it, it's really, um, really up to, I guess, oh, time will tell. <laughs> So Jeremiah was written about 627 
um, to, well, I should say Jeremiah prophesied from about 627 to about 585, somewhere in there. He is very likely that he died in Egypt the, after Babylon, uh, the Babylonian Empire destroyed um, Israel, Judah, I guess you could say. Um, some people were like, hey, we're going to go ahead and kill these Babylonian rulers, and we're just going to go ahead and get on out of here to Egypt. And Jeremiah's like, yeah, that's not a really good idea. And they don't listen to him. They do it anyways, and then they take him and go to Egypt. And he's like, yeah, you guys really shouldn't go to Egypt because Babylon's going to come to Egypt. And, and they do. And uh, uh, he likely dies there in Egypt. Um, if you want to know more about the historical setting of the book itself, um, you can read in 2 Kings chapters 22 to the end of the book and 2 Chronicles chapter 34 to the end of the book. Um, it actually gives pretty good uh, details there. And Jeremiah actually has some historical details that are not uh, mentioned in Kings or Chronicles. So as far as what was going on in world history, um, Judah was a very small and insignificant nation. I mean, it really didn't have much to offer to the world. Um, they worshipped this god Yahweh, which nobody else was worshipping, and that's pretty much the only thing that, that was unique about them. But in the bigger system, there was this, this really scary empire called the Syrians. And um, they had very brutal ways of killing people. <laughs> and uh, so th they, they got this bright idea of destroying the city of Babylon. And they did. But people got kind of upset because Babylon was considered a holy city. So they decided, you know, that we kind of made a huge mistake. We'll just go ahead and rebuild it. So they rebuild it. And within 50 years, <laughs> the, the Chaldeans who are living there rise up and create what's called the Babylonian Empire, Babylonian Empire, and that's in 626, and uh, it doesn't fall until 539, so they had a pretty good run of it, not quite 100 years. Um, they conquered Judah in three stages, um, 605, 597, and 586, and uh, as they went through conquering, it was uh, more and more damage was done, like the first time, if I remember correctly, they only took like the smartest and, and you know, best well off. The second time around, they, they took like, you know, all the all the important people and stuff and then the third time around they, they took pretty much everyone except for like the, the poor farmers that they just didn't really care about and uh, but Jeremiah they left and the reason for that probably is because um, Nebuchadnezzar who was the king of Babylon um, Jeremiah prophesied frequently he said hey you guys should surrender to Nebuchadnezzar and you guys shouldn't fight him and because he's going to win anyway so you might as well just go ahead and do that and we'll look at that as we get there though and uh, so Jeremiah was left there, presumably because of that. Jeremiah is also uh, the longest book in the Bible. Uh, we will, how we'll look at it is we'll go from, we'll, we'll look at each prophecy, and hopefully we'll get through at least like two prophecies uh, per week, and that way we won't be on the book until we die. <laughs> okay. um, Jeremiah is also an interesting book because as far as I know, he's, possibly the only prophet who talks uh, very extensively of the coming covenant, which is what we experience under Jesus. Um, he talked about the way that, it, what it would do and, and how we would, you know, have this, you know, circumcision of the heart and like this whole, you know, this whole thing that, that Paul unpacks. And, and it starts with, as far as I can tell, with Jeremiah. And that's just a, an interesting little thing there. Uh, a I guess we could wait to talk about that. Yeah, we won't talk about that. Uh, so, where did it happen? Well, most of the prophecies were, were given when Jeremiah was in Judah, but some of them were given in, in Egypt. Um, they they were they regarded a lot of different places, though. Uh, some were, you know, about Babylon or about the Egypt and so on and so forth. Um, there is a notable difference um, in the manuscripts of Jeremiah. So there's the Hebrew text called the Masoretic text, which is what we have in our Bibles, the Christian Bible. But there is another version of Jeremiah, which is found in what's called the Septuagint. Uh, the Septuagint was a Greek translation of the Hebrew Scriptures. So you took the Hebrew Scriptures and translated into Greek for people who didn't speak Hebrew anymore. Um, and uh, it is notably shorter. Yeah, this might alarm some people. Here's the reason why it shouldn't alarm you too much. First off, it's not as old as the Hebrew text. So that's the first thing. Second off, uh, it's filled with, 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 with different errors and just oversight where they just missed things. Um, it is possible that they were translating from a different version and uh, of, the, of the Hebrew. And also the translator is shown repeatedly throughout the Septuagint to just not be a very good translator. It's, it's questionable why 
they didn't get somebody who knew who could have done a better job. But, um, they also as uh, the Septuagint has a different order than than our Bible does. So I wouldn't take any of that too seriously. Um, the Jer the Jeremiah that we have is most likely the right one, and you know there's very little little very little um, margin of error there. Um, nothing really to get concerned about. Jeremiah is actually a book that isn't overly um, argued about. Nobody really disagrees that Jeremiah really wrote it and when he wrote it. Um, so it's it's not really one of those things you need to be like, oh no, you know, did it, did we accidentally get it in the Bible? Not not really. I mean, I'll look at it and we'll look at that in just a minute. But the short answer is no. What's the main theme of the book? Well, the main theme of the book it has a couple different themes, and I'll try to break it down. First off, without repentance, there's judgment. That's probably one of the key themes of the book. Second, um, sin has consequences. And uh, that's really a lot, a big part of what Jeremiah is talking about. You know, God's people were trying to live um, not good. <laughs> And then they didn't want anything bad to happen. And God kept saying, hey, you know, you guys need to stop doing bad things. And he just wouldn't listen. Um, and then a third thing would be Yahweh's sovereignty. So Yahweh is the God of the Hebrew Bible. I don't know if you guys know that or not. Um, and uh, what I mean by that is he was sovereign not just over Israel, but he was sovereign over all the nations. And in the prophecies, you see how he's going to do all these different things of all these different nations. And uh, kind of a big picture kind of thing. The idea that he kind of ruled the nations. Now that might that's may, maybe not be how you how you think of it. So um, God ruling the nations doesn't mean that in every single decision that the nation itself made, he was like behind it. Rather, it means um, even if he allowed them to make bad decisions, he had ultimate power. So if they did something bad, like that was on them, and he gave them that choice. But he could still like. Um, he could still change things around. He could. St he would still bring punishment. And that's actually what the last half of Jeremiah is about. You guys did these bad things. You thought it was cool just because I, I let you do it. But no, now there's going to be you know consequences for your actions. The same is true for Hitler. Like God would, didn't stop being in control because Hitler came to power. But Hitler was responsible to God for all the things that he did. The same kind of basic concept. Um, so here's a map um, that, that kind of shows... Uh, this over here, I'm going to assume that you guys don't know anything about the area, so that way we're all on the same um, same starting point here. Modern day, this is Egypt, so this is Africa here, and uh, Yemen is over here, or, yeah, and uh, Iran is over here, this is Turkey, Greece is over here, Italy is over there, um, The uh, Europe is over, over here, and, and Russia is up over here, they're kind of... Okay, so this is the Mediterranean Sea here. And this little dot here is Jerusalem. There's a little black dot. Anathoth is right about there. It's about, if I remember correctly, it's about three miles outside of Jer Jerusalem. So that's where he came from, and now you know. I got this map from allocation.com. Maybe not .com, but either way, the, south, the site's called allocation. So what is a prophet? Well, let's try and make this simple. Um, a prophet is someone who speaks God's mes message, yes, but it's someone who also speaks with God's heart. First Corinthians makes the comment that, excuse me, First Corinthians makes a prophet that if somebody has all secrets and all hidden knowledge, and they speak with the tongues of angels and of all men, but they don't have love, their words are nothing. It's just a noise. It's a clanging sound. So a prophet is someone who doesn't just have God's words. They also have to have God's heart, you know, and... and, and that's a very important thing because nowadays we have this idea of prophets who are these raving lunatics. And the biblical prophet is not that. It had to be someone who, who was speaking um, with love. And uh, that's, that's definitely um, something we don't necessarily hear talked about a whole lot. Um, they saw their prophecies as a succession and a tradition. They didn't see themselves as um, lone islands. Um, they, they didn't see themselves as the ultimate source unsubject to any authority. So a good example that would be Jeremiah saw that he had to, his prophecies had to be in agreement with the books of the law. He couldn't just prophesy whatever he thought. A word from God, if it was truly from God, had to be in agreement with all of scripture. And um, that's definitely something that we see in prophets. Nowadays, there's people who call themselves prophets, and they just come with these wild things. And they contradict the Bible and, you know, they just say whatever they feel and they think, because I feel it, it must be true, really, from God. And that's not how it works at all. Um, 
And then there's this whole idea, oh, except God alone can judge me. And it's like, well, you know, actually, that's not so much true um, either. Prophecies were subject to checks. You know, there there were things that had to be um, had to be verified, if you will, if you want to say it like that. Um, how could I say that differently? So let me kind of break down what those checks were. Did the pro did did what was prophes prophesied actually happen? You know, if somebody claims that something is going to happen and doesn't happen, that's not much of a prophecy. There was a lot of prophets who said that President Trump was going to get elected for a second term, and then he didn't. <laughs> so that would be a good example of a false prophet. Um, the prophecy actually has to come true. Um, and then if they were true, did the prophet try to lead people astray from God? If somebody prophesied something and it came true, but the person who prophesied it, they tried to get people to worship a different God besides Yahweh, they were a false prophet, which brings up an interesting point. People who don't worship God, who, you know, get involved in dark things like Wiccan and different stuff like that, and the cult and whatnot, they can't. There is still an element of power in the demonic realm. There is. It's not like it's oh, it's fake, and you know, you, there's no. That's not true. There very much so is, is is power in the demonic realm. Obviously, we as Christians don't have to be scared of it. Obviously, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. So, um, and, which brings up a very interesting point. Even if you like the person who gives you a word, don't just believe something because they say that it's from God. There has to be some kind of you know, pray about it, read the Bible, see if it agrees with what God already said in his word. Um, another point that I want to make is that we don't have all of Jeremiah's prophecies. It is possible that Jeremiah could have messed up once or twice with a prophecy that wasn't recorded. You know, just because all the all the prophecies that we have of his are from God doesn't mean that he always said the right thing all the time. I mean, think about you guys. You guys always say the right thing all the time. Do you never mess up? I mean, you know, I, I think that... You know, just because Jeremiah was a true prophet doesn't mean that he, you know, never messed up. Yeah. So, anyways, some uh, some people give false prophecies because they're lying, and that's what most Christians assume is happening. But there's also another reason why people give false prophecies, and that's because they were misled. Um, you can get confused in your own own mind. And uh, we're gonna look at uh, when we look at Jeremiah. There's actually gonna be a part where this where this comes up. So what makes a false prophet as compared to a true prophet? Um, if somebody messes up, if they say something that's not true on accident or something like that, that that's not necessarily the same as being a false prophet. Um, it's possible to serve God, to be a Christian, to love God, and to still do something wrong to still make a mistake it's just it's possible so even if you were let's say you were a modern day prophet you have the word of god that doesn't mean that every single thing that comes out of your mouth is always going to be right everybody makes mistakes on occasion so a false prophet isn't somebody who makes a mistake a false prophet is someone whose message is fake and they in their heart are not really genuinely serving god um, and um, I think that's good enough. I have on my YouTube a a breakdown of um, how you can tell if a word when somebody says, "Oh, I have a word of word from God for you." If, how you can tell if it's actually from God because a lot of them are going to be fake and um, whatnot. And so I'm not going to waste my time here. If you want to watch that, you can watch that. Uh, a good example of this would be how many people say they love Jesus, but the definition of Jesus they love isn't the Jesus of the Bible. Like they'll say, oh, I love Jesus. And it's like, well, tell me about this Jesus. Oh, well, you know, he never judges me and he's he's only loving and accepting. He forgives everyone. It's like, well, everyone who accepts and believes. Like he doesn't just forgive everyone. Like he, he, he made a free gift if you don't accept the free gift. Like, um, and the the definition isn't the same definition. So like, there's kind of a kind of a breakup. So like in the Old Testament, for instance, when Jesus did things like um, led Israel in war against other people, oh well, you know, I'm going to ignore that part of Jesus, but then I'm going to like the part of Jesus where he dies on the cross because I, I like that. It's like, well, yeah, but without judgment, there can't really be forgiveness. And um, so that's one just one of those things. <clears throat> Oops. So prophets. 
did two things primarily. They foretold and they foretold. What's the difference there? They told the future, yes, but oftentimes they would just tell the, the word of God, you know, when people were living in sin or that kind of stuff. Um, the, the prophets developed apart from the kings. They were not ruled by the kings. This gave them a good amount of freedom because they didn't, um, they, they didn't have to watch what they say lest the king kill them. Um, they had a heart for people and for God rather than one or the other. Um, they genuinely wanted people to change. They weren't just angry yellers. They, they relied on the law. They, they weren't social reformers. They weren't trying to find, you know, women equality or, you know, um, freedom for slaves and that kind of stuff. What, what, what their message was was reconciliation to God. They were not social reformers. They were spiritual reformers. So um, during this conversation, there's always somebody who grew up in a, in a certain kind of church. So if this doesn't relate to you, don't worry about it. I'll make it quick and we'll move on. If it does, we'll pay attention real quick, okay? <clears throat> so for a lot of us who grew up in the church, we had this idea that you had to kind of prove your dedication to God. And so you would think something like, I've been called as a prophet. I have to do these showy things as an expression of my faith. So you would you would try and work yourself up into into bigger and greater things, and you would even convince yourself that God told me to do this. So you'll go and do something real showy to prove your dedication to God. You'll you'll go and stand up in front of people or interrupt a sermon and say, "I have a word from God," and all these things. Just to do any anything these all showy things to get to get attention. And uh, some examples of things that I've seen or or either been a part of. Um, interrupting a service to give a word from God, uh, going to a town hall meeting so you can tell them the word of God and all this different stuff, uh, yelling at Walmart parking lot and all this different stuff. I, I've seen a lot of people do that. Here's the thing. If God called, you would know. When, when God calls someone, it's you, you know. It's not something that you have to guess. You have to prove yourself. It's something that God says, do this, and you go. That's, that's what Jeremiah did. He didn't do anything to prove. In fact, when God said, hey, we're going to look at this next week. When he said, hey, I'm calling you, he's like, yeah, I, I'm, I'm just a kid. You're calling the wrong person. And um, <clears throat> he typically doesn't speak um, in that way now. So in the past, God used prophets, and they would go and they would prophesy in the city, in the city square and stuff. Well, in modern days, God really doesn't do that. He doesn't speak that way anymore. Uh, he speaks a lot through his word. He speaks through people. He speaks through pastors. He speaks through, you know, um, devotional times of, of being in prayer with him. He, he really doesn't speak in, anymore in that whole, you know, prophet in the town square thing anymore. So if you're thinking that, that, that God's calling you to do that, kind of push the brakes on that and hold off a couple years. And if it really is from God, it'll work itself out. Um, okay. And then also another thing is God's calling has nothing to do with your level of dedication. That's the last thing I want to say about that. So, what is a prophet? Uh, just a few other things I want to mention. It's not somebody who lost control or went into a trance. There's this idea that, you know, your eyes go back and, oh, I know. That's that's Hollywood. That's not really what a prophet does. In fact, the the Bible actually says that a pro, that the spirit of, of a prophet is subject to that prophet. So in other words, they don't lose control just because God's giving them a word. They are in control. They can control when they say the word. They are not like, I have to say this right now and interrupt the service and interrupt your life. And da, da, da. If you guys have never experienced this, it's very awkward where they just you know walk up to you and like, hey, I got a word of God for you. And it's like, well, I'm kind of in a conversation here. So, you know, that's that kind of disruption and just awkwardness isn't really from God. Um, another way you can kind of tell when something's from God is that God, God's words typically give clarity and encouragement. And if it's not from God, it'll just bring confusion. It'll just be like, what the heck's going on here? Uh, the prophets of the Bible didn't emphasize uh, religious observations primarily. If you look at other prophets, it's always about um, doing all the right things, you know, all the right religious things, you know, lighting the candles and, you know, this and that and the other thing. But in in the, the biblical prophets, their emphasis was on God's law, obeying God's law, but also on interpersonal relations, how you treat each other, what your attitudes are towards other people. Uh, so if a, a prophet, for instance, would focus on, hey, um, Eli, you need to forgive so and so. Or hey, uh, Gracie, you need to stop, um, you know, not paying Isaiah for the work that he did. So you know, in more interpersonal relationships and that kind of stuff. Um, also, the prophets of the Bible were separate from the 
um, pagan prophets in another way, and that's that they they didn't just prophesy to the elite. They also went to they went to you know regular people, and that's one of the reasons why when you read Jeremiah, you're going to find it relates to you so well, is because it was prophesied to people just like you, regular old Joes. Um, another thing is prophecies can sometimes not come true and still be from God. Um, what I mean by that is prophecies are dependent on the current reality, not what might be, not what was, what is. So if somebody currently is living in sin, a prophecy can be given against them. And then if they turn and, and turn towards God and turn away from that evil thing that they're doing, then that wrath that God promised oftentimes doesn't come true. Not all the time, but oftentimes. So God would turn from them. And the prophets of the Bible have a long view orientation. So what that means is they're not just focused on right now doing all the religious things of going to the temple and offering your sacrifices. They're focused on the long-term view of, you know, um, where your life is headed, where the nation is headed, what's going to happen afterwards, that kind of stuff, the big view. They're not short-term oriented. So that brings up a question that um, was asked multiple times um, during the term for President Trump's second term. Were, the, were, the, were they true prophets who prophesied Trump's second term? Well, the prophecies didn't come true. And then when they didn't come true, they made, they made the claim that it didn't ha that God didn't bring President Trump in as the savior for the second term because you know we didn't deserve it. But the thing is nothing changed. The people didn't like turn to sin. Nothing changed. And so claiming that that it didn't happen just because we didn't deserve it or whatever, that's just a cover up. That that's through and through a false prophecy. Um one other thing I wanted to mention about prophets, uh, there are other prophets whose messages were not preserved or they don't, who don't have a book. For instance, if you read the books of Kings, you'll find out about Elijah and Elisha, neither of which have a book. Um, recording their prophecies. How do we know that Jeremiah was a prophet? Well, the, there's a few ways that we can tell. First off, he claimed to be. This in and of itself means nothing. You can claim whatever you want. That doesn't make it true. However, the fact that he claimed to be and then the things that he said actually came true builds on the credibility. It's not like he said some things that accidentally came about. No, he said from the beginning that he was a prophet called by God. Second off, um, Israel and the church accepted him as one and, and preserved the book of Jeremiah. So you've got tradition of the Jews and the Christians um, throughout, you know, thousands of years saying that he was one, which once again, people can be misled. So that's nothing in and of itself. His message doesn't contradict the united whole of all 66 books over hundreds of years, including Jesus coming and the New Covenant, which is, you know, phenomenal since that was, you know, over 500 years since Jesus came. I mean, that's, that's pretty phenomenal. Uh, and then the last thing, which is the final, the final sure foundation uh, that we know that he was a prophet, his prophecies came true. I mean, anybody can claim to be a prophet and say anything, but if your prophecies don't actually come true, well, it's obviously you're not really a prophet, but Jeremiah's prophecies actually came true. Um, even to the point of, of people by the name that he called them. So how do we know that he really wrote it? Maybe just some other crack job. Crack job? Crack. Crack job. Uh, whack job. Let's do that. Oh, there's some other whack job wrote it. Um, there's a few ways. Um, do you need to get that? Um, I'll, I'll stop if you need, if it's important. It's important. Okay. All right. Uh, so how do we know that he wrote it? Let me figure out what I'm saying here. Oh, first off, uh, he gives very precise details uh, in the book regarding the fall of Jerusalem and the stuff that happens there. And it's very hard uh, facts that would not have been known after the fact. So th the fact that he's able to give us a clear picture of what was going on there um, strongly argues that he was actually the person who wrote it. Jeremiah was well known. Why would Israel preserve something from an unknown prophet after the exile? You know, when when when, when Babylon came through, they exiled the, the people of Israel. And when they exiled them, um, they got real serious, which is where the, where the Pharisees came from. And um, the question then being, why would they preserve the book of Jeremiah after the exile if they knew it was fake, first off? And then second off, how would they have possibly fooled them if the, since the prophet Jeremiah was known by the people of Israel? That's just, it doesn't really doesn't really follow. 
Um, there's no real reason historically or academically to disbelieve it, even though there isn't anything to compare it to. So what I mean by that is we don't have another book written by Jeremiah necessarily. Lamentations might have been written by him, but we don't really know. So we can't like compare it and say, oh yes, this is definitely his, his speaking style or whatever. Um, but we, there's really no reason to disbelieve the claim. There, there's nothing that, that throws a, a monkey wrench in or anything. And, and as I said, pro, Jeremiah is one of the pro, one of the prophets who really isn't argued by the academic circles. Scholarly circles don't like, oh, well, we don't really think Jeremiah. No, nobody really says that. And it's unlikely that it was preserved through, throughout Israelite history for no reason. And it's also unlikely it was drastically changed when no other prophets were. There was this, there's this teaching that um, some of the prophets were kind of latched onto, and a school called the Deuteron Deuteronomistic school was just like drastically changing them to, to, to and modifying them to match what they taught. But that's very unlikely because none of the other prophets were, and there's no evidence of that or proof of it or, or you know clear indications of it. So I hope that this kind of helps you understand um, the book of Jeremiah because next week we're just going to look at um, at the prophecies and we'll try to um, keep them around tops of 30 minutes.